all rise. Very well away. The International Criminal Court is now in session. Lujan Sela Corpinal International, eight word. Please be seated. L'audience est ouverte. Judge Cott, please be seated. The hearing shall now begin. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Mr. Katanga. The chamber wishes to extend greetings to the official representative of the DCR. Trial Chamber 2 shall now, pursuant to Article 76 of the statute, hand down the decision regarding the sentence we intend to impose on Germain Katanga. The Chamber wishes to remind parties and participants that on the 7th of March 2014, the majority of the bench issued its decision with Judge Christine van den Vangart dissenting. Pursuant to Article 74 of the statute, on that day, the chamber acquitted Gilmar Katanga of the crimes of rape and sexual slavery, which are crimes against humanity and war crimes. The chamber also acquitted him of the crime of having children less than 15 years of age participating actively in hostilities, also a war crime. On the other hand, the Chamber found Joma Katanga guilty of being an accessory to a number of crimes committed during the attack of fe February 24, 2003 on the village of Bogoro, a locality in the Ituri district in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. In more specific terms, these crimes comprise the following, the crime of murder, which is a crime against humanity and a war crime, the crime of conducting an attack on a civilian population, or on civilians not taking part directly in hostilities, which is a war crime. The crime of destroying enemy property, a war crime. And finally, the crime of pillaging, also a war crime. After receiving a great many filings from the parties, the legal representative of victims and the registry, the chamber held a sentencing hearing. This hearing spanned two days, namely the 5th and 6th of May 2014. On the 5th of May, the current chief of the village of Bogoro was called by the prosecutor and he gave testimony via video conference. Thereafter, defense witnesses D04, correction, D02401 and D02404 were heard. Subsequently, the prosecutor made her final orb oral submissions, summarized her arguments, and requested a sentence of 22 to 25 years of imprisonment. On the 6th of May 2014, the legal representative of victims made his closing statements, followed by the defense of Germain Katanga. Thereafter, Mr. Katanga made a statement himself, as is provided for in Article 67.1h of the statute and was thus the final person to address the court. In order to hand down the appropriate sentence, the chamber took several factors into account. Although these factors were quite dissimilar, the aim of the chamber was to ensure that the sentence imposed would be meaningful. Articles 77 and 78 of the statute do not specify the ultimate aim of criminal penalties imposed. All the same, the preamble of the Rome Statute provides some guidance. The preamble speaks of the most serious of crimes of concern to the international community as a whole must not go unpunished. The preamble also affirms that the state's parties are determined to put an end to impunity for the perpetrators of these crimes and thus to contribute to the prevention of such crimes." End of quote. Thus, our task is to punish crimes that threaten the peace, security, and well-being of the world. Once again, a quote from the preamble. And to ensure that the sentence truly serves as a deterrent. When 
handing down a sentence, the chamber must also respond to the legitimate need for truth and justice expressed by the victims and their family members. Thus, the chamber is of the view that the sentence has two major functions. On the one hand, it serves to punish, that is to say, to express society's disapproval of the crimes committed and their perpetrator, which is also a way of recognizing the harm and suffering that the victims have undergone. On the other hand, the sentence serves to deter others from committing similar crimes. The punitive nature of the sentence thus tends to hold in check any and all desire to satisfy the thirst for vengeance. It is not so much the harshness of the sentence that is of importance. It is the inevitability of the sentence that must prevail. Moreover, the chamber must ensure that the sentence is proportionate to the crime, as is set out in Rule 145.1a of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence. The sentence must also serve to bring once again to the affected populations and help them achieve reconciliation. And finally, a sentence that is proportionate to the crime helps to encourage the convicted person's return to society, even though, particularly in the realm of international criminal law, this goal cannot be considered to be of the first magnitude since the sentence cannot in of itself ensure the guilty party's successful return to society. To determine the sentence, the chamber must take into account the relevant evidence presented and the submissions made during the trial, as is set out in Article 71, Correction 76.1 of the Statute pursuant to Article 77.1 of the Statute, and Rule 145.3 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, the Chamber may hand down a maximum sentence of 30 years of imprisonment. Unless the extreme gravity of the crime and the personal circumstances of the person found guilty warrant a sentence of life imprisonment. In addition to a prison term, the Chamber may impose a fine and or forfeiture of proceeds property and assets derived directly or indirectly from the crime in accordance with Article 77.2 of the Statute. Article 78 of the Statute and Rule 145 of the Rules of Procedure and Evidence, which deal with the Chamber's determination of the sentence, stipulate that the Chamber must take into account such factors as the gravity of the crime, and the individual circumstances of the convicted person. The Chamber shall also consider any mitigating or aggravating circumstances and shall assess the weight of any other relevant factors. Nevertheless, the Chamber does wish to specify right from the outset, as the defense reminded us in their closing submissions, that the existence of mitigating circumstances is relevant only to lessen the sentence and in no way takes away from the seriousness of the crime in question. In the instant case, the Chamber took several factors into account, which I shall now explain, before stating the sentence that we believe must be imposed to determine a fair sentence. One must first assess the gravity of the crimes perpetrated by the accused. The punishment must thus reflect the gravity of the offense itself. In this regard, accused persons who appear before the court must realize that the crimes that they have been charged with constitute the most serious breaches of international law, and consequently, the penalties for such crimes are severe. Not all the crimes for which Jama Katanga has been found guilty are equally serious, and thus the Chamber assessed the precise nature of these crimes. For instance, we made a distinction between crimes uh, committed 
against actual people and crimes that were property crimes. To assess the gravity of the crime, one must take into account the specific circumstances of the case as well as the way in which the accused persons took part in the crime and their degree of participation in the offense committed. The punishment must fit the crime and must be in keeping with the convicted person's culpability. Furthermore, the gravity of the crime must be assessed both qualitatively and quantitatively. First of all, in connection with the circumstances of the case, the Chamber recalls that in our decision, we found that the entirety of the crimes, murder, a war crime and a crime against humanity, attacks on civilians, destruction of property, pillaging, all of which are war crimes, these crimes committed by the Ngiti militia from the collectivity of Walendu Bindi occurred during one single attack which occurred on the 24th of February 2003 in Bogoko. Many civilians were injured or killed because of these crimes. In the view of the chamber, there is no question that the crimes that were committed on that day and at that place were widespread in nature not only because of the circumstances under which the attack occurred, but also owing to the fact that the primarily Hema population living in Bogoro were clearly targeted. The scars of the fighting that occurred on that day can still be seen today. In its decision, the Chamber concluded that on the 24th of February 2003, Bogoro had been fighted by, had been attacked rather by fighters who arrived from all directions. They arrived in the village very early in the morning at about 5 a.m. while it was still dark, while the villagers were still at home and still asleep. Because the attackers arrived from all different directions, it was very difficult for the villagers to flee. Most of those who testified as victims had hidden in the bush and had managed to move away very quietly, thus making their escape. After the attack, dead bodies lay everywhere. In fact, the chamber noted that the Ngiti attackers did not limit themselves to taking control of Bogoro by attacking the UPC forces that were there. During the fighting, and after they gained control of the village, the attackers even hunted down and killed civilians who had not taken part in the hostilities. This occurred throughout the entire village, and in some cases in the civilians' actual homes. The chamber also took note of the fact that once the attackers had overrun the camp, they slaughtered the residents of the village who had taken refuge there. More specifically, those who were hiding in the classrooms of the Bogoro Institute, the chamber is of the view that once the fighting was over, the attackers continued to hunt down the villagers who had hidden themselves in the bush, and that they captured people who were caught unawares in their hiding Places. Some of these people were subjected to sexual violence by the attackers, while others were killed. None of these people had taken part in the fighting. When all is said and done, the chamber saw that the people living in this village had been targeted systematically throughout the course of the day. The crimes against civilians followed a regular pattern and were particularly violent. Some of the crimes were not committed with firearms, but rather with machetes. The attackers literally carved their victims up, limb from limb, before killing them. Witnesses told of how the attackers did not just shoot at the villagers as they fled. The attackers slashed them with the machetes and knives as they tried to make their escape. This practice, a particularly cruel one, caused extreme physical suffering, both, both for those who were killed and those who somehow managed to survive despite their pain. The machete blows also caused 
serious and ongoing trauma, both for the survivors, some of whom had to go had to undergo amputations, as well as trauma to those who were witnesses to the suffering of their family members. The women and men who survived these crimes will forever bear the physical scars, to say nothing of the psychological scars caused by witnessing crimes of such cruelty. Those who survived the slaughter had to flee, leaving everything they own behind. When they returned to Bogoro, the inhabitants tried to recover the bodies of their family members who had been killed in the attack. Yet very few were able to do so, and few were able to organize the appropriate ceremonies to mourn the dead. Family members were separated from one another and experienced the anguish of not knowing for long periods of time whether their husband, wife, child, father, mother, sister, or brother was still alive. In addition to the various crimes that I've just described, the chamber concluded that on the 24th of February 2003, the attackers destroyed or torched the homes belonging to the people of Bogoro, most of whom were Hema, or they removed the sheet metal roofs of the villagers' dwellings. The attackers also destroyed the buildings of the Diguna church mission, in particular the Seca 20 church, which the people of the village attended. The chamber found that these acts of destruction unfolded throughout the entire village, throughout the entire day, even once the village had fallen and was controlled by the attackers. According to several eyewitnesses, most of the buildings were burnt to the ground, destroyed, and the chamber was able to see that many of the current houses in the community had to be rebuilt later by an NGO. The chamber also found that attackers stole a wide variety of household possessions belonging to the civilian population of Bogoro, most of whom were Hema. These items necessary for day-to-day -day life included sheet metal roofing, furniture, other household items, food, animals, in particular cattle. The looting was done by the attackers themselves, as well as by women and children who assisted them, and some of these women and children were armed. Moreover, the fighters forced people who had been captured in Bogoro, especially women, to carry the looted goods for them. The loss of these possessions has had major consequences on the daily existence of the victims. At present, many of them have been forced to start new lives for themselves away from Bogoro. Some did not wish to return to the village and reestablish themselves there because they would have to start all over again with nothing. In some cases, these people just did not have the resources to go back home. The chamber also noted that several witnesses testified that they had heard the attackers' threats and they had heard the victims crying and begging for mercy. The chamber also wishes to stress that several witnesses stated that the fighters specifically questioned the villagers about their ethnic origins in a, order to determine their fate. And several people only survived because they had been able to convince their attackers that they did not belong to the Hema community. In connection with the current situation in Bogoro and the harm done to the victims and their family members, the chamber has reviewed the testimony of the current chief of the village of Bogoro and the Babiaze groupement. As village chief, this witness is in contact with the people of Bogoro each and every day, and thus he was very well placed to inform the court about the situation of the people living in this area. The witness stressed that currently the main problem of the residents of Bokoro was no doubt the suffering that they endure because of poverty. 
He stressed that even now, the aftermath of the fighting is still felt. There are a large number of widows, widowers, and orphans in the community. Many of the orphans have no foster homes. He also reminded the chamber that before the attack, the village had several schools. But now, ever since the attack of February 24th, 2003, parents are having great difficulty providing their children with an education. The village chief mentioned that many families had suffered because of the damage done in Bogoro on that day. He also stressed that some residents of the village still suffer from physical disabilities or psychological trauma or both. According to him, they still vividly remember the attack of 24th of February 2003. In the final analysis, a great many people from Bogoro can no longer play a role in the economic and social life of their community. I now wish to turn to another matter, once again, in relation to the gravity of the crime. The Chamber has reviewed Jama Katanga's degree of participation and his intent. The Chamber reached the conclusion that had not been shown that in February 2003, the Ngiti militia from the collectivity of Walendu Bindi was in an organ, was, or formed an organized uh, power structure. And that at that time, Jamel Katanga wielded control over the militia such uh, to control, uh, as to exercise control over the crimes within the meaning of Article 25.3a of the statute. However, the chamber was of the view that Jamel Katanga had made a significant contribution to the commission of a number of crimes committed by the group of commanders and combatants from the collectivity of Walendu Bindi. Insofar as his contribution had a major influence on the occurrence of these crimes and the manner in which they were committed. The chamber also wishes to stress the importance of Jamal Katanga's contribution in the context of this case, more specifically in the context of the collectivity of Walendu Bindi in February 2003. The chamber recalls that Jamal Katanga's actions allowed the militia to benefit from logistical means, resources that they did not have previously and yet were of great usefulness for their attack on Bogoro. Owing to Jama Katanga's contribution, the Ingiti combatants enjoyed military superiority over their UPC adversaries, and they were able to achieve their goal, namely to eliminate the civilian population of Bogoro, for the most part made up of people from the Hema group, without the strategic military alliance struck by Jama Katanga. And without the weapons and ammunition that were provided, the Ingiti combatants would not have had the resources they needed to carry out the attack of the 24th of February successfully. They would not have been able to conduct the attack so efficiently and carry out their criminal purpose, which was to wipe Bogoro off the map and to eliminate the primarily Hema civilian population living there. Furthermore, the Chamber was of the view that in February 2003, Jamal Katanga did indeed hold the highest ranking position within the Ingiti militia of the collectivity of Walendu Bindi. This militia was at times called the FRPI, and he was, at least on the 9th of February 2003, the, the president of this organization. His title was commander or chief of Aveba. He was a confirmed and recognized soldier, and he had definite military authority within the collectivity. As for the power that he actually enjoyed, the chamber concluded that he did facilitate the transportation of weapons and ammunition 
from Beni to Aveba, as well as the storage of said weapons and ammunition. He had the authority to not only allocate weapons and ammunition to the commanders of the collectivity of Welendubindi, but also to decide the quantity of ammunition that would be allocated. In this regard, his instructions were followed. The chamber also concluded that on the 24th of February 2003 in Bogoro, the local combatants from the collectivity of Walendu Bindi had used the weapons and ammunition that had come from Beni and that had been allocated to them once shipments had been received in Aveba within the specific context of this case. The chamber concluded that the actions taken by the convicted person had had a major influence on the commission of the following crimes, conducting attacks on civilians, murder, looting and destruction of property taken as a whole, his actions and the various ways in which he made his contribution had a significant influence on the commission of these crimes. Moreover, Jema Kantanga made his contribution to the commission of the crimes with full knowledge that the Ngiti combatants of the collectivity of Walendu Bindi were driven by an anti-Hema ideology, which he himself shared as well. He knew, given the manner in which the group had behaved previously, that the Ngiti militia would commit the crimes of murder, homicide, attacking civilians, as well as the crimes of destruction of property and looting. As the chamber pointed out in its decision, Jema Kantanga knew full well how to wage the war that was underway in Ituri at the time of the events. He knew full well the suffering that this war would cause the civilian population. He was familiar with the events that had occurred in Yakunde in September 2003, only a few months before Bogoro was seized. He gave many details about those events, and he himself described what had happened as a massacre. Consequently, the degree of participation and the intent of Jamakantanga in this case must not be underestimated particularly since the crimes that were committed on the 24th of February 2003 were particularly cruel. In addition to the gravity of the crimes, which the Chamber has just mentioned, one must also ask questions about mitigating and or aggravating circumstances and whether they actually exist in this particular case. Four aggravating circumstances must be considered according to the prosecutor. First, the particular vulnerability of the victim. Secondly, the particular cruelty of the crimes. Thirdly, the motive, the discrimination. And fourth, the abuse of official powers or functions. This is pursuant to uh, Rule 145. The legal representative of victims shares the prosecutor's view regarding the first three aggravating circumstances. The chamber reviewed the gravity of the events and has already taken into account the fact that the crimes were committed with cruelty and that the inhabitants of Bokoro included vulnerable people, particularly children. The chamber considered the, the d discriminatory nature of the attack. The chamber only analyzed the fourth aggravating circumstance alleged by the prosecution, namely abuse of official power and functions. The chamber uh, remembers that uh, as of the 9th of February 2003, Jema Katanga was indeed the president of the Ingiti militia of the collectivity of Walendu Bindi. Furthermore, 
During the period prior to the attack on Bogoru, he had a certain degree of military authority in that collectivity, and he played a key role in the supply and distribution of weapons and ammunition to the various commanders who were based there. Germain Katanga was a particularly seasoned and renowned combatant and was equally a key player in anything that had to do with the supply of weapons in the collectivity. He had the authority to carry out a needs assessment and to take decisions by himself relating not only to the principle of distribution but to the quantities of ammunition to be allocated and for that purpose to issue the necessary orders which were complied with. The Chamber is of the view that the aggravating circumstance in question here requires evidence that the accused not only exercised a certain degree of authority, but that he also abused it. However, in the instant case, it does not appear that Germain Katanga indeed abused his position of authority or that he used his influence to facilitate the perpetration of crimes. That being the case, the Chamber does not believe that the status of the accused nor his exercise of his powers as a, someone in a position of authority can be considered as an aggravating factor. The Chamber will now present a summary of its findings on possible mitigating circumstances. Both the prosecutor and the legal representative are of the view that the accused must not benefit from any mitigating circumstances. On the contrary, the defense believes that the young age of Germain Katanga, the nature of the role that he played, the exceptional circumstances in which he found himself, the fact that he has the potential to reform the manner in which he cooperated with the court, as well as the organization of his personal and family life, are all elements that the chamber should take into account to mitigate the sentence to be imposed on him. To begin with, regarding Germain Katanga's personal circumstances, the chamber notes that the accused was 24 years old at the time of the events. The chamber also recalls that at the end of the year 2002, several other local commanders were in a similar age bracket as him, and accordingly, the chamber believes that the argument relating to Germain Katanga's young age should be viewed in perspective. Nevertheless, as proposed by the defense, the chamber is receptive to the convicted person's statements to the effect that he has been a changed man since 2003, that he has become an adult, and that he has started understanding more and more things that he probably had not understood during the period in question, notably in relation to his level of maturity and the constraints that he was subject to within his community at the time. That notwithstanding, Regarding this last point, there is absolutely no doubt that Germain Katanga, like many other members of his community, suffered greatly for the acts, from the acts of violence perpetrated against the civilian population of their collectivity. It is nonetheless obvious that the convicted person who has a willing and enterprising spirit as demonstrated throughout his testimony, chose between 2002 and 2003 to take the initiatives he deemed to be necessary in full knowledge of the facts on behalf of his community and in a well thought out spirit of military ethnic conquest. True. Such an attitude, which is both protective and belligerent, made it possible for him to gain the trust of the members of his community while advancing his endeavor to earn respect 
which are all values that are considered essential in his community. And therefore, he cannot today be reproached for trying to acquire those values. The fact remains that the chamber cannot accept, in spite of the particularly sensitive context within which the convicted person was at the time, that he, as the defense claims, found himself inextricably trapped at the end of 2002 and in 2003. The chamber will now consider the family situation of Germain Katianga. He is the father of six children. He sees his family only twice per year. And according to the defense, he shows the keenest interest in his family, particularly when it comes to the welfare and education of his children. The chamber notes the tender age of some of these children and the fact that for reasons beyond their control, they are faced with the difficulty of growing up far away from their father. And it is of the opinion that having a close-knit family is an asset that could facilitate the reintegration of Germain Katanga. With regard to Germain Katanga's reputation, or what could be referred to as his good moral standing, the Chamber recalls that it has already determined that in August 2002, he was a particularly renowned and seasoned combatant, as can be attested to by the evidence on record. The Chamber has also pointed out that the, the convicted person had a good reputation, at least at the end of 2002. Nevertheless, the Chamber is of the view that such considerations, which are mainly linked to his courage as a soldier and in his actions on behalf of his community, may not be considered as mitigating circumstances. However, according to several witnesses, it appears that Germain Katanga contributed actively towards the protection of the civilian population of his community and that he had a good relationship with that community, whereas other commanders were known to be quite adept at causing incidents even amongst that very population, even going as far as confiscating property and instituting reigns of terror. Accordingly, the Chamber believes that the young age of Germain Katanga, the fact that he is the father of six children, and his positive and protective relationship with the civilian population of his community are uh, important elements that can be taken into consideration to mitigate his sentence. Nonetheless, these elements cannot play a substantive mitigating role given the nature of the crimes for which he has been found guilty and which were perpetrated against the Hema civilian population of Bogoro. As such, the chamber will accord them only a very relative weight. Going beyond the personal circumstances of the convicted person, the chamber will now consider Germain Katanga's conduct after the events. The defense underscores the fact that Germain Katanga gave his support to the peace process which was ongoing in Ituri as from March 2003 and throughout the years 2003 and 2004 up until his integration into the Congolese army, and that he encouraged the disarmament and demobilization of the militias and child soldiers. The defense further submits that the demobilization program could never have been implemented without his participation. The chamber considers that the efforts that were made to promote peace and reconciliation may and should be taken into account in determining the sentence and that they are potentially of a nature to constitute mitigating circumstances. However, it is the chamber's view that such efforts must be both real and sincere without there being a requirement for results to be produced. In the opinion of the chamber, after having analyzed all the evidence on record, 
It is not possible to establish on the balance of probabilities that Germain Katanga did indeed try through the efforts that he is supposed to have made to actively promote the peace process as a whole. The fact remains in the Chamber's view that several documents and testimonies attest to the positive role that he played in the disarmament and demobilization process for child soldiers. The Chamber considers that the active participation of Germain Katanga in the demobilization process has been established on the balance of probabilities, given his conduct and positive contribution at the time. As such, the Chamber is of the view that his efforts should be taken into account in the sentencing decision. Furthermore, regarding the expression of remorse and sympathy towards the victims, the Chamber notes that the expression of remorse can be considered as a mitigating factor, but only if such remorse is shown in a sincere manner. Besides, even though expressing one's sympathy or sincere compassion towards the victims can also be taken into account for the purpose of determining the sentence. It does not, under any circumstances, amount to an expression of remorse, and in the Chamber's opinion, should only be accorded a very low value. Also, the Chamber cannot fail to point out that, in the course of the trial, Germain Katanga did not make any statement that would indicate deeply felt and sincere remorse. At the very most, he made a few statements reflecting his compassion for the victims and his wish to see that justice is done. Also, the Chamber recalls that during his closing statement, at the sentencing hearing, Germain Katanga, in general terms, expressed his compassion for the victims of, quote, that war, unquote, that is the war in Ituri at that time, before sharing the feelings he had more specifically for the victims of his own community. The Chamber considers that those statements were also much too general. The fact is that German Katanga is still having great difficulties acknowledging the crimes perpetrated. Lastly, in the observations it communicated to the Chamber on the 4th of April 2014, the registry stated that it did not have any reliable information on possible initiatives by German Katanga to compensate the victims. In response to a specific question on this matter, the current village chief said he was not aware of any initiative by the convicted person for the benefit of the victims. In view of the foregoing points, the Chamber, as a result, will not consider the statements made by Germain Katanga about victims as constituting an expression of sincere compassion or remorse that could be treated as a mitigating factor. As to Germain Katanga's cooperation with the court and his conduct in the detention center, the Chamber notes that contrary to the rules of procedure and evidence of the international criminal tribunals, which stipulate that such cooperation must be notable or substantive, Rule 145 does not require that to be so. The Chamber further notes that the jurisprudence of the international criminal tribunals has become progressively flexible and that the Chambers have a wide margin of maneuver in the factual assessment of what constitutes notable cooperation or not. Être retenu à titre de circonstance atténuant. In the Chamber's view, in order to be considered as a mitigating factor, cooperation has to be substantive it has to be to extend beyond mere good conduct, which, 
even though is appreciable, cannot by and of itself amount to a factor likely to mitigate the sentence to be imposed. In the instance case, the chamber points out that Germain Katanga testified at length that he answered the questions put to him by the parties, the participants and the judges without any difficulty, and that he spontaneously offered up various items of information and points of clarification. Accordingly, the chamber, to a certain degree, has decided to take that positive attitude into account in its sentencing decision. That said, the chamber cannot take into consideration the fact that Germain Katanga attended the hearings and behaved well with the staff members and security officers during the proceedings, that being the normal conduct that any chamber expects as of right from an accused person. Now, with regard to Germain Katanga's conduct in detention, the Chamber duly notes the internal memo communicated to it by the Registry on this matter. It is satisfied on reading the document that Germain Katanga's conduct over a period of six years can be generally considered as positive. The Chamber further notes that even though the defense responded to this matter in its observations of 7 April 2014, it did not argue that such conduct should be considered as a mitigating factor. Accordingly, the Chamber shall make no finding on this point. Lastly, as concerns the violation of the rights of the defense, which is an argument raised by Germain Katanga's defense on the basis of the time that its client spent in the Kinshasa Central Prison between the 10th of March 2005 and 18th October 2007, the Chamber considered that if a violation of the fundamental rights of the convicted person had been established, it would indeed be proper to, to, to take that into account for the purpose of mitigating his set, sentence. However, the Chamber finds that there is nothing in the statute authorizing the court to rule on the legality of Congolese detention procedures or to determine whether those procedures have been violated. As such, the Chamber believes that it has no mandate to rule on any violation of his rights that Germain Katanga may have suffered in the DRC at a time when his detention was not subsequent to an order of the court. On the other hand, regarding the period during which Germain Katanga was detained at the request of the court, it is the opinion of the Chamber that if any violations have been established, they may only be attributed to it if they related to proceedings before it. It is out of the question for the Chamber to deal with possible violations of Germain Katanga's rights if they are in no way related to the proceedings before the court, even if such violations supposedly occurred while he was being detained in accordance with an order of the court. In the instant case, the Chamber finds that the defense did not demonstrate that the proceedings conducted between 17 September and 18 October 2007 during the notification of the arrest warrant issued against Germain Katanga had been characterized by irregularities. For all the reasons set out above, the Chamber sentences Germain Katanga to 12 years imprisonment for aiding and abetting within the meaning of Article 25.3d of the statute, the crime of murder as a crime against humanity. Twelve years imprisonment for aiding and abetting within the meaning of Article 25.3d of the statute, the crime of murder as a war crime. Twelve years imprisonment for aiding and abetting within the meaning of Article 23.3d of the statute, the crime of attack against a civilian population as a war crime, 10 years imprisonment for aiding and abetting within the meaning of Article 25.3d of the statute, the crime of destruction of property as a war crime, 10 years imprisonment for aiding and abetting within the meaning of Article 23, 25.3d of the statute, the crime of pillaging as a war crime, 
pursuant to Articles 78.3 of the statute, the chamber pronounces a joint sentence of 12 years imprisonment. With regard to the time spent in detention in the DRC, and which might be deducted from the sentence at the discretion of the court, the majority of the chamber, contrary to the arguments of the defense, was of the view explained at length in this decision, which will be available soon, that it did not have sufficiently precise and correct information that would have enabled it to take that period into account and deduct, deduct it from the sentence. On the other hand, pursuant to Article 78.2, the Chamber orders that the time spent in detention in accordance with an order of the court, that is, from 18 September 2007 to this day, 23rd May 2014, shall be deducted from Germain Katanga's sentence. Lastly, in the absence of any information relating to the financial circumstances of Germain Katanga, the Chamber has not sentenced him to a fine. For these reasons, the Chamber sentences Germain Katanga to 12 years imprisonment for aiding and abetting or otherwise assisting in the commission of the crimes of murder as a war crime and a crime against humanity, directing an attack against a civilian population as such, or against individual civilians not taking direct part in hostilities as a war crime, and the destroying of enemy property and the pillaging of property as war crimes. George Christine van der Weingart appends a dissenting opinion to this decision. The chamber with the bench, which started with the commencement of the trial in November 2009, has come to the end of its work. Pursuant to decision 3468 of the presidency of the court dated the 16th of April 2014, it will be a different bench under Article 75 that will take over the reparation procedure for the victims. Before I leave you, on behalf of the Chamber, I would like to thank the parties and participants for all their contributions and the quality of uh, their work. Once again, the Chamber would also like to thank all those who contributed uh, to the good conduct of these uh, proceedings. Uh, this session is adjourned.